Welcome to day four of how to build a godly and manly foxhole. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson of Undaunted Life. Let's get into it. All right, guys, let's do a quick recap in days one, two, and three of this devotional. We spent some time diving into three different questions. Those were what makes a godly man? What makes a manly man? And can you be both godly and manly? So in day one, we talked about what makes a godly man. We talked about the truths that exist outside of the self. That's the narrative of humanity that we all find ourselves in. And then the second thing we looked at was truths displayed publicly. And that answers the question, what makes a godly man? And we listed those characteristics. In day two, we talked about what makes a manly man. So at Undaunted Life, we have a definition of what a man is, and it's this. A man is a male that cultivates spiritual, mental, and physical resilience daily. Daily. We spent some time talking about deceased Navy SEAL Adam Brown and also Paul, especially his second letter to his pupil Timothy. And then in day three, we talked about whether or not you can be both godly and manly. And we talked about how, yes, of course, of course you can be godly and manly, even though some people would tell you that that's not possible. We looked at Adam Brown again as an example of that, but then we went deep into the story of Nehemiah, specifically the first four chapters of the book of Nehemiah to talk about that. So guys, we want to make sure that in order for you to have a good day for you, you need to make sure you've listened to those first three days before you come back and take in this day's lesson. So today we're going to be focusing on this question. Was Jesus a manly man? Now, you might be wondering to yourself why we're focusing on the manliness side of Jesus and not the godliness side of Jesus. And if that's you, smack yourself. I mean, come on. I mean, we're not talking about whether or not Jesus is godly because, well, in Jesus' own words, John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. And if you need to know whether or not that's important, it's recorded later in John, John 14, verse 6, that Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So again, I'm just kind of saying that a little bit in jest. So we're not really going to be focusing on the godliness part of Jesus because he's, you know, kind of God, but we are going to focus on whether or not Jesus was a manly man. So the, the quick and easy answer to that question is, well, yeah, duh. I mean, of course, Jesus was a manly man. He was the manliest man because he was the sinless, perfect man. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we see this. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But if I were to venture a guess, and I would say that many of you, if I had just come up to you on the street and asked you to name me the manliest men you know of, living or dead, you would not even think to say Jesus. I'm dead serious. Just think about that scenario. Would you have said Jesus? Because you might say your dad or your grandpa, or you might say George Washington or Theodore Roosevelt or Ernest Hemingway or Jack London or John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or Adam Brown or Jocko Willink or Joe Rogan or David Goggins or, you know, on and on and on. You would probably just run off those names. And why is that? That's a really, really important question. Why would you think of culturally significant men, either from politics or Hollywood or entertainment, military, etc., and not the perfect, sinless son of God? Why not him? And the answer might surprise you. I have a contention, and my contention is that it's a lot the church is doing in the church's fault, why we don't think of Jesus when we think of a manly man. And so I, I think through this because there are two key periods in this for me. And the first was the Industrial Revolution. That's kind of the late 18th and early 19th century. And then the two world wars. So think early 20th century. So where were all the strong, able-bodied, masculine men during the Industrial Revolution? They were working. They were working thankless or dangerous jobs, either underground or in a factory, something like that. I mean, these guys were working. So where were the strong, able-bodied, masculine men during the world wars? Well, they were off fighting, right? And in a lot of cases, dying. So then we see the turn. So many of the manly men who would have otherwise gone into ministry, they died or they sought employment elsewhere, right? They, they sought out other opportunities. And then we see this sermon content, the, the focus of sermon content and, and music and decorations and missions and different things like that. They all became a little bit more effeminate during this time period. Now, the turn was gradual, but not sure if it ever stopped. I don't think we've ever seen it stop even till the modern day. 
Which kind of brings to mind John 1 verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> now, one thing that we see with sermon content during this time, and it has continued for in large part, especially with some of these larger churches, is it went from truth and justice, you know, masculine type qualities, to grace and forgiveness, which tends to be a little bit more on the effeminate scale. Now, they're both good messages, and they're both appropriate messages, but they're definitely on either side. They're on different sides of this issue. They're on different sides on the masculine, feminine scale. Now, when you talk about music, the music went from singing the praises of the conquering just God to singing about Jesus, kind of like he's your boyfriend, you know, someone that you just want to cuddle up with and warm up with by the fire. And also, we have a more pluralistic and relativistic and feminist culture now in modern society, and that has kind of exacerbated this. And what that all comes down to, and it all combines into this, is it, it gets us to where we are today, where men are leaving the church in droves. There's rampant fatherlessness all over the Western world, really all over the entire world, especially in the West. And then also we have Christianity losing its standing in the West. Because we, we have a church that is so overwhelmed with trying to be like the culture when it's when they're in the counterculture that they're the strongest. Some of the fastest growing churches in the world are in China, North Korea, and Iran. Right? It's completely counter to the culture of those places. So I guess that begs the question that that has Jesus changed? And of course we would say no, of course not. Jesus is 100% grace and truth, not 50-50, not 60-40. He's also 100% lamb and 100% lion. Now, the modern church has changed our focus to where we're almost exclusively focusing on the grace part or almost exclusively focusing on the lamb part when they're essentially ignoring the truth part of who Jesus was and who he came to be and the lion part of who Jesus was and who he came to be. So let's talk about our Savior and Lord Jesus, and let's see if we can figure out by looking at some scriptural stories whether or not he's a manly man. So we're going to start in Matthew 10, verse 34. This is Jesus talking. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. So the Cambridge uh, Bible Commentary points this out. It says the contrast is rather between union and division than between peace and war. But essentially, Jesus is not concerned about our comfort as much as he is concerned about God's truth. So that will surely cause some division and cause some consternation, but that's kind of a manly thing to do to stand up for God's truth. So that's a nice story. Then we get into Luke 4. We're going to look at verses 31 through 37. So this describes a situation where Jesus casts out a demon just with his voice. So here we go, verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. So Jesus casts out a demon, a powerful demon, with his voice, with his voice alone. That's not bad, but let's take it up a notch. So now let's look at John 11. So this talks about the reclaiming of Lazarus from the dead. We've all heard the story, but we're going to get into it. But here's the deal that most people miss. When Jesus arrived post Lazarus's death, the Greek root word for his expression when he arrived translates to snort with anger. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have been so so angry in my life before where I was snorting with anger. I was I was so angry. That was Jesus's mindset when he showed up. He wasn't whimpering, he wasn't, you know, combing his beautiful dirty blonde hair. No, he was snorting with anger, okay? So let's look at John 11, verses 38 through 44. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, 
Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. So, Jesus screamed at a dead guy and told him not to be dead anymore. That's pretty gangster. That's pretty manly. But, but this, it goes even further than that. When it said in the scripture that he called out in a loud voice for Lazarus to come out of the tomb, that is the same Greek word that's used to describe the storm that nearly sank the apostles' boat in Matthew 8. We see that in verses 23 through 27. I mean, the same word is used to compare gale force winds, hurricane style storm, in the, in, you know, that, that almost killed the, the apostles, right? The same word is used that he used for his voice, the same word. But now we're going to get into my favorite story from scripture. And this is from John two, and this is verses 13 through 16 short story, but there's a lot packed into it. So let's look at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple. He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. That is Jesus. Okay. That is our savior. That right there, that's the lion of Judah. Now, what's it? There are a lot of things that are lost on a story like this. Okay, but I want to point a few of those things out. The first thing is that this was an example of premeditated aggression from Jesus. Premeditated, okay? Because we see no sign that Jesus already had a whip on him when he arrived. I don't remember anywhere from scripture where it's talked about how Jesus walked around with a whip on his hip. Well, like I, just, I just don't see that anywhere. So Jesus either found a whip or what I would like to think, he made a whip. He left, made a whip, and then came back, okay? And it probably took a little bit of time for him to do that. So it was premeditated aggression. Then we also see this. Not only was it premeditated aggression, it was sustained aggression. Because again, he drove out all of the men, the sheep, the oxen, he drove all of them out of the temple, okay? And there were likely not just a few of those people, right? And sheep and, and other animals. There was probably a lot. So you have to think about this. This took a long time of him being aggressive, okay? To clear the entire temple, it was sustained aggression. But in addition to his premeditated aggression and the sustained aggression, we have this intimidating aggression. So during this entire long process where he's clearing the temple, we have no evidence to show, and the scripture certainly doesn't tell us that anyone tried to intervene. Think about how crazy of a situation that would have to be to where no one even tries to stop him. You know, I was just sitting down with some of the guys that are in my Sunday school class and there was probably, you know, a, a couple of dozen people in there. And we were talking about the story and we were talking about what would happen if some stranger walked into that room and started overturning tables and trying to drive people out with a whip, man, it would be a problem for that person, right? I mean, for the most part, like for a lot of us guys, we've been training our entire life for that exact scenario where we get to just wreck some dude for doing some sort of craziness. But can you imagine what would have to happen for some stranger to come into our room and to be so intimidating that we wouldn't even think to stop him? That is the exact scenario that Jesus found himself in in the temple. Those people didn't even try to stop him because of his premeditated, sustained, and intimidating aggression. So this leads me to a quote from, from a very good book. It's called Why Men Hate Going to Church from the author David Murrow, and the quote's here. The Lion of Judah was very popular in fundamentalist churches as recently as a few years ago, but even here his sun is setting. It's no wonder why. He doesn't seem to be a very good Christian. Because again, in this situation, Jesus was so angry at sin, and he was so angry at somebody disrespecting his father in his house, 
that he was willing to go and do something that by modern standards we would see as probably sinful. Oh, you, you probably but shouldn't be that aggressive. You shouldn't be that angry. You know, let's just talk about grace. Let's only let's only worry about the grace part right now. I'm sure there's a conversation that needs to be had and there's a relationship that needs to be built with all these people. No, at that moment, Jesus needed to respond. And he did so in a very, very godly and manly way. So was Jesus a manly man? I, you bet he was and still is. I mean, he's part of the Godhead, the triune God, the Trinity. So he's godly in every way that it's possible to be godly. But he's also manly in the truest, most perfect sense. He is spiritually resilient, mentally resilient, and physically resilient. And there's a couple of stories that slam that home. We'll we'll go into detail on one. But this story is from Luke 4, and this is the temptation of Jesus. So this is Luke 4, verses 1 through 11. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory. For it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Okay? So this is a very important story of Jesus because he experienced every possible temptation in those 40 days in the desert. The devil was all over him. Okay, so let's work backwards. Physical resilience, obviously going 40 days without food. It's a bit of an issue. Uh, I remember when I just recently tried to do a two day little fast and I made it about 30 hours. So again, that's a hard thing for someone to do. It takes a lot of physical fortitude and resilience, but also mentally. You're wandering through the desert. Um, This is a tough situation. You're hungry, you're thirsty. And also you got this pesky little ultimate demon that's, you know, basically on your shoulder screwing with you the whole time. But then the spiritual resilience in these situations, when the devil presents something to him that seems reasonable for him to respond in kind with scripture every time, even when Satan starts quoting scripture to Jesus incorrectly, obviously being the father of lies that he is, but to respond in such a way that it shows unbelievable spiritual maturity, right? That is super, super manly. Again, if we're talking about spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, that is a tremendous example of that. But guys, if you need that to be slammed home even harder, then just go look at the Gospels. And specifically, I'm going to give you Matthew 27, verses 27 through 50, okay? So in these scriptures, Jesus is mocked, he's crucified, and then he dies. Now, I'm not going to read that to you. I want you guys to read that one on on your own, because obviously being Christians, as most of you listening to this are, and if you're not, we're, we're so glad that you're here digging through this material. But as you read through the Gospels, it can seem like just something that happened pretty quickly or flippantly. I mean, again, from Matthew 27, verses 27 through 50, we see Jesus being mocked, crucified, and then dying. It's a, it's a very quick thing to read. It might just take you a couple of minutes. But this was a sustained amount of of horrific torture that Jesus went through until he finally died. Just imagine the amount of spiritual, mental, and physical toll that you would be going through in those moments. And we had Jesus crying out at different points, crying out, asking his father why he's forsaken him, just the anguish that he was going through. But ultimately, he sustained himself. He sustained himself in that moment. He steadied himself And he went through with the entire process, even though he could have delivered himself from it. Again, most of us are never going to have to go through something even vaguely similar to that. And so I think all of those stories that I went through from the very first one all the way through this last one, we're talking about the crucifixion and death of Jesus prove that he was a manly man. And it's a super easy flow chart, right? 
So if you ask, was Jesus spiritually, mentally, and physically resilient, which is what we talk about here at Undaunted Life as being a man? Easy. Yes. So he is a manly man. Did Jesus cultivate spiritual, mental, and physical resilience daily? Easy. Again, flow chart. Yes. So he is a manly man. Period. Case closed. All right, guys, before you move on to the next thing, here are some questions for you to ask yourself. Number one. If asked to quickly make a list of manly men that you know of, would Jesus have been on your short list? If not, why do you think that is? Again, guys, I kind of made my contentions earlier in the episode, but I'd be interested to hear if that would be for you. Cause I, I did ask a lot of guys that same question and all of them answered, man, I would not have thought of Jesus. And these are good, solid Christian dudes. And it just never occurred to them. All right. Second question here. Are you more familiar with the lamb of God or the lion of Judah? So depending upon your answer on this question, it'll kind of give me a better idea as to the type of church you go to or the church that you grew up in, in terms of what they spend the majority of the time focusing on. And then the last question is this, do you hate sin like Jesus hates sin? Again, going back to him clearing the temple, he didn't do that. He didn't get angry because it was some sort of like a road race situation, like, like this nonsense situation. It was tremendously righteous indignation and anger that he showed in that moment because he hated sin. He didn't allow it to creep in. He didn't allow it to kind of hang around him. He hated it so very much. So you got to ask yourself, do you hate sin like Jesus hates sin? All right, guys, for more content like this, check out the rest of our podcast episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to leave a review and a five-star rating and check out our website at www.undaunted.life. Make sure you come back tomorrow for day five, where we introduce the concept of a foxhole. Until then, Keep pushing back darkness. Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.